we're absolutely delighted to to host what is turning into a really really very vibrant and well attended series our our, our um, writing Jewish women's lives seminars. Um, just to remind you that on the twelfth of March we have the colloquium, which would have been the inaugural colloquium had it not had to be postponed because of terrible terrible world events. Um, but it will now be on the 12th of March and we will have a whole day of fantastic speakers and a drinks reception afterwards. So do please come and join us for that. It will be in person only and it and the talks will be recorded and put on the website, but um, do come and be part of it. If you've got any questions about how to register, do send us an email. Otherwise, all the details are on the Life Banking Centre website. Um, Absolutely delighted to have a, a double whammy of delight uh, today. We have not one but two fabulous speakers. Lisa has joined us before, and we're really delighted to be able to meet you back to Oxford. Um, and Deborah, it's, it's wonderful to meet you. Um, so they will be talking about um, um, Lisa's most recent book, Losing the Dead, and other writerly intimacies. Um, and just to give you a a little summary of their many, many achievements, which would take most of the session where I to go into detail. Um, Lisa is uh, has been chair of the Royal Society of Literature, of the Freud Museum, and um, is former president of English Pen, which for those who don't know, is a fantastically important organisation campaigning for free speech and supporting persecuted writers. She's an honorary fellow of St. Bennet's Hall here in Oxford, a visiting professor at King's College London. And she's the author of many, many books, um, including um, Mad, Bad and Sad, A History of Women and the Mind Doctors. She's uh, done a major study of Freud and his relation to women. She's written novels and thrillers um, and a tremendously honest and moving memoir of grief, Everyday Madness, uh, which was in fact my introduction to, to your work, Lisa, which I I knew your partner a little in Cambridge and it found it extraordinarily moving and poignant and very, very true. So that was a, a real revelation to me. Um, and um, and Dr. Deborah Baum here is, um, among other things, uh, Lisa's uh, daughter-in-law, um, <laughs> but also associate professor at the <laughs> <Southampton. laughs> this, this is a family, family enterprise today. <laughs> Um, she's we a writer, together. <laughs> a writer and filmmaker. She works on marriage in literature and across the arts, feminism, philosophy, life writing, docufilm, auto fiction, all kinds of amazingly exciting things. So this will not be the last time you get begged to come and talk to us. And we can have a whole series on your work. Um, she's carried to the Ratledge um, International Handbook of Psychoanalysis and Jewish Studies, and um, and which is coming out in next year, I think. Yeah, that right. Um, and she's published um, her book On Marriage, which looks at marriage in literature and art and film and memoir, and has also written Feeling Jewish and The Jewish Joke. So I think it's fair to say that there could not be a pair of people more qualified to talk to us today about Jewish women's life writing. And I am hugely looking forward to it. So thank you both very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I found, found it, there was this original email that Lisa, what about this Deborah Brown, do you think she might be in it? <laughs> <laughs> and I think Lisa was like, you know what, I know her. <laughs> <laughs> She's married in. Oh, so so very well. it's a, it could be the start of a whole new thing. It could be the start of a whole new thing. But I, I, I understood because when you invited me to talk about losing the day, you were ill. You had to talk to somebody else. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So we true. haven't had to talk about Yeah, yeah. I was meant to do it once and I got conveniently ill. So, uh, <laughs> um, and losing the dead is not the most recent. Actually, Everyday Madness is the most uh, recent oh, uh, uh, memoir. So, Losing the Dead was published just in a, with, with a real consciousness of this timing this is news i don't know if people uh um that's uh, there's been several new colors, been several new colors. Mm -hmm. but that, that's little lisa there mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but losing the dead uh was was i think published in 1999 and it had a real consciousness i think about it of the approaching millennium the way in which memory was 
memory and uh, was was making itself felt in, in, in particular ways. There was a sort of cultural pressure on that moment that the book was alive to uh, as it went back and, and searched for other memories. Um, and it is, um, I would say, uh, the most, I, I teach it actually. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 I think it's the most intelligent telling of one's own life or one's own familial life. It, it, it has a kind of intelligence to it that is odd. It's almost uncanny mm -hmm. in, in, in life writing, which is characterized and, and the book is uh, very aware of this, which is characterized normally by the cluelessness of people <laughs> about, I mean, the, the, about, about them, their own lives, uh, mm -hmm. memoirs and so on. But because that is sort of front and center of the project, that sense of not knowing, um, there's a kind of intelligence to this book, and it's also very beautifully written, that makes it, uh, I, that I think, really sets it apart from a lot of other uh, uh, memoirs. Family memoirs, even though I'm in the family, I think I can get away with that. I didn't know this book, actually, uh, this book, but it's dedicated amongst to other uh, amongst other people to my husband. <laughs> um, I think it plays a small role. It plays a small role. It plays a small very, very early on. Um, I should. I might, I bought a couple of books by me because I I I thought as I was reading this, my book feeling Jewish actually re refers to Lisa's memoir, Losing the Dead. And goes into it a bit, and my my latest book on marriage goes into this book every day. <laughs> in fact, so there's a lot of sort of yeah, the, the incest taboo is broken in all kinds of ways. So um, um uh, in uh, literary. So um, so so um um uh, I I have written some questions, but I I think I actually occurs to me I want to start with the title because that's the thing I'm looking at now. I think it's a provocation right there on the cover. It's confusing immediately. What does it mean, losing the dead? Well, the first thing I want to say to you is that I'm very pleased that you're my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have to say that the war is really incredible and far more real. Um, um, and um, her book on marriage is a colossal text in the first instance. And how they can have philosophy of marriage is one of the things that is put into question by whether one can. Um, and then feeling Jewish, well, I'm not going to go into this because I would draw into the door of her, uh, who's also happens to be very good luck for my. We might not live, leave this stuff. <laughs> 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 <I'm very biased. laughs> um, Right, why losing the dead? All right, well, I'll tell you a story for that. Um, the title of this book, which was a search for my an attempt to put some grounding into and some documentary feeling into my parents, very much spoken, very much narrativized by my mother, Cass, at a moment when my mother was actually beginning to lose her, not only her memory, but her mind. I mean, what we didn't yet know in the early stages of all this, that we thought and that they were. Um, the title um, came to me as I was sitting in a train with a very dear friend, Don Gata, uh, from New York, whose father was, of course, a former psychoanalyst. Um, and I, we had just come from the city of Woods, which is apparently. Say apparently because I was never present at one's birth, but also um, I don't have a birth certificate, but I was apparently born in the city. Which I had gone there um, this was in the nineties uh, to find out whether I could find anything out of family, but also to see that there was a birth certificate. It was quite a useful document to have, particularly and to appreciate these things. Um, in any case. Um, so, and, and the story of the book is about finding, but in fact, everything that I went to look for, or a lot that I went to look for, had been lost. And in the last instance, um, my own sort of coming to the world was lost because we hired a lawyer for this and we followed him around town. Um, you know, um, he couldn't find his birth certificate. <laughs> The buildings that were down and so on. And I was born post, not post war. 
And um, also we hope to find my grandmother's uh, grave, because she was apparently buried in what is the largest Jewish cemetery in Europe in the city of Łódź. Um, but of course we couldn't find her grave. <laughs> And so I sit on the train and I said, this wasn't a trip about finding the dead. It was a trip about losing the dead. And um, those two words, finding and losing, are actually the opposite one which is the way it goes. Because it begins in the disability. So my mother was losing her mind. She had also, in this losing of her mind, gone back time and again to the fact that she had lost her brother during the war, and her brother was the savior of the family. But as her mind became increasingly narrowed, both to the present and to the recent past, she was really rather fixated on her brother, and she kept seeing him here, there, and everywhere. And she would see him in very young men, and mostly in men, and never in old men. <laughs> um, you know, she comes to the TV, there's my brother, you've got a ring, I TV immediately, blah, blah, blah. And so we, we go through that and, um, of course, couldn't find him in Poland. So we suspect, certainly now, the time many years ago, um, but also all the things that I still have to look for. Some I did find because of the family calls, but the specifics uh, were never found. So the book was about losing the dead. And of course, it has to be larger, perhaps, which is the um, um, in finding things out about my parents' past, about the war, years and the attempt to relive the new derailment, I was also, in fact, losing them for myself. Memory is a funny thing. And when you write something out, it's gone. Um, it's yes. equal to so it also knows so it has to be there. So it has you know, all the repercussions of the last and losing that. Is it so a, that's a very long answer to a very no, it's, easy question. It's such, a, it's, such a, it's such a rich answer already. And uh, but, uh, there's actually a quote I think I'm going to ask you to read it out um, from your book, which I pointed it out anyway, because th there's the idea of losing properly, that there's a proper way to lose. Um, and and um, uh, could, could you read this quote? If you or, or if it, maybe you can't. Okay, this is from very, very long in the book. And uh, it's one of the motives forces for writing it. I would like to give my mother's past back to her, intact, clear, with all its births and deaths and missing persons in place. The task I know is impossible. The dead are lost. But maybe, nonetheless, it makes a difference if by remembering them, we lose them properly. And so this book was an attempt to lose them properly, but, but also um, we haven't set the context for this, <laughs> um, so perhaps I should. Um, the idea for the book um, was really my children's attempt in my mother's losing of her mind. I've written a lot about losing the mind. I was like good at those things. <laughs> um, not my own, necessarily, but others. <laughs> and um, my children. Um, say I, I lost my, mind. Um, my children wanted somehow to return my mother's past to her and to them because she was beginning to act very strangely. And um, my daughter in particular, Katrina, um, thought that if we could fill in the blanks in her memory, then perhaps she would regain her memory. And so, so the book was also amongst many other things, an attempt to uh, give a kind of more documented past back to my mother, um, a past which went to her land of birth, which is Poland, um, and uh, would somehow put the things that she had lost back in the places that she had once again finding. But of course, this was difficult because you have to lose the dead properly, and by this time she had Alzheimer's. Her death appeared in different ways. Is that what you think? No? Yes. So there, it's a book of remembering. It's what it's a memory of this plays such a huge role. It's, it's sort of because there's an implicit setup there that, that there is an improper way to lose the dead. Like, 
uh, and that somehow um, the way your mother, your father lost their death, that was there was nothing proper about uh, uh, about about that. And uh, and so and so there's something implicitly reparative about this journey in an attempt to um, fill in the blanks. I think we can talk a lot about life writing or as filling the blanks mm -hmm. and uh, and um, and what kind of what you can do when there aren't facts. And one one of the things about you as as a thinker and as a writer is you like facts. <laughs> you like yeah. it. And one of the reasons, and we find out in this book, one of the reasons you like facts so much is because your mother had no relationship to them. <laughs> so your mother was was a was a spinner of tales. You say, I mean, she 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 was a compulsive liar. Uh, and she had reasons for that. Can we talk a, a little bit about that? I think she was a compulsive storyteller. Compulsive storyteller. She wasn't a compulsive. I mean, I'm sorry to be a little more in depth. Yeah. Um, she told stories to cover over um, certain things. But of course, the covering over is also covering up. Um, and the story of this book, I don't know if I'm going ahead of you or not, is, is really on a parent's life during the war years. They kept go back into those war years in Poland, um, where they ended up masquerading um, as homes, um, as arrogance. And um, this is a whole masquerade uh, was something which filled my mother extremely well. Uh, it's not so easy to not bother to do. And I play out in the course of this work uh, the blonde dark nexus and what that can mean in certain times. Um, in fact, one of the first readers of this book who loved it was Zadie, Zadie Smith, who, who is also a friend of the family. And, and um, um, Zadie said, This is just like my family, it's just like me. And of course, it is and it isn't. Um, but what does it mean to have a past? What does it mean not to be swallowed in that people? What is identity? And this was just at the cusp of identity politics and um, ever since been transmuted many times in many different ways. It still flows through the book. Um, and my mother was uh, a woman of, um, well, we can go into masquerade later, but it would be uh, what Joe Riviera has said, oh, it's uh, technically called masquerade, um, which is something that the Jew can say is true. To be the mother of a lot, already many other kinds of other. So my parents said, with many students during the war. They lived in part where they had an older brother who was also coaching these with them. So it was a very interesting um, time with a very horrible time to be in But so, um, did I answer the question? I've forgotten it now. <laughs> well, I've done the question. <laughs> um, but because there is a, there is a kind of, um, story we get of yourself as a child in this book, in which, in a way, although officially this book, you know, is sort of spurred on by your mother is lo losing her memory, you become aware of yourself as one of the last generation who do, does have a direct sort of, uh, can touch that period of history, that vocal period of history, the survivors are all sort of on their way out, and you, 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 you're sort of related to it directly, it's part of your inheritance in a, in a direct sense. So you want to go in search of the facts, and also your children are saying we should get them, we should get them before they're gone, before they're lost. And that, that I mean, that a familiar trope actually. Quite a few memoirs that came out uh, around that time. But in the book, we also get a sense that even as a child, it was very unclear to you what the facts were um, because uh, because your mother. I mean, it's sort of very funny. It's sort of painful, but very funny. You do descriptions of your mother giving, you know, it's telling a comedy, but it's just a comedy, <laughs> telling, telling, just, just telling people what they want to hear or what she thinks they want to hear. That to some extent, this is now in Canada after the war. During the war, this was under the pressure of the need for survival. You told people what they want to hear, and at some point, you say, "My mother's interlocutor is always and forever the best officer," and that's a line in the book. Um, how do you get over that? 
when you've left, uh, uh, you know, Nazi occupied Europe and you're in Canada. Well, you don't. And so you're still figuring out who to be with this person, that person. And, and, and so you, you as a child are sort of noticing her telling this person about the same, that the weather was great, and then about the same occasion, it was terrible weather. <laughs> and somehow the weather has been altered for this person, uh, uh, to that person. And it was a strange atmosphere for a child to grow up in. And so you become already kind of in need of the facts. And there's a description of yourself sort of terrified about being asked direct questions about, about yourself. Can you talk about, uh, uh, about where you come from, where you're born? Yes. I mean, there was this confusion. Um, this book is in part a comedy, I have to say that. Not only because of the art, where um, you know, losing things properly <laughs> is better than just not having lost them. Um, and that's what the book is in part about. It's kind of a refuge of the book in some ways. Um, but my mother's narrative always, as I remember, is uh, one that casts you into some confusion, particularly as a child. You don't really you know history, and the history you know is perhaps that morning or yesterday. <laughs> and um, and suddenly you've got kind of world history passed onto you, which you have to make sense of. You know, it doesn't mean very much because it keeps shifting. Of course, real history, real history changes all the time too, but for a child all of this is rather um, peculiar, like so many things about adults are. Um, and my mother was, I, I would have said, you know, you know, storyteller. <laughs> As an adult, I can say that. As a child, it was very uh, odd because these stories would shift and change very much. And they were stories that were told really to please the person she was with. So. She's not a compulsive liar. No. She's a compulsive storyteller. So if it's important that yesterday the sun was shining when you were talking to X, she just says it. It might be raining. Not just something like that. <laughs> and so on. And and I ended up in this family thing out. My brother had been through the war, a strange character. Um, my father was often silent. Um, and I was the person who would brought me to the three, so what I thought was the three. So I was not a good aroma. <laughs> no, it wasn't raining, you know, it was sunny, <laughs> um, et cetera, et cetera. So we had this, you know, family balance of different kinds of powers in relationship to this strange thing called truth. Um, Again, I've forgotten the question. I'm going back into childhood now and imagining these characters and like, they are rather strange. I mean, I'm different yes. <laughs> <laughs> as I imagine them. But but in, in this book, I tried somehow to capture this and to try and make sense of it for myself as an adult. I really didn't know where I had been born because that too kept shifting as we shifted languages and places where we lived. Um, I both knew that I'd been born in Poland and also knew that I'd been born in, in Paris um, because I lived in French Canada and I spoke French and I didn't speak French and I could sort of understand it, but not really. Um, and so, so there were there were these strange um, relationships to fact. Um, and of course, as I grew up, I became more and more interested in, you know, <laughs> where is the fact? <laughs> is there a historical you know, nexus, which tells you something about the real. Um, and my mother wasn't mad. My mother was extremely beautiful and very competent and rather successful and always worked all her life. Um, but this aspect of her, when you were inside the family of what was truth and what was fiction, was, was difficult. If there's this um, line, it goes through my head all the time, actually, uh, just these two words. Wait, I think you say, you you go into, even today, you go into a shivering panic uh, when you're asked to sort of say your name or where you're from or, or whatever, that, that somehow, you know, and I, I'm interested why that line goes through my head so often because, and I think it's partly because I notice that whenever I'm telling anyone anything about my life or what happened to me, I have the impression that I'm lying. And maybe that's why the word lie, lie is worth that somehow whenever I say anything which I believe to be the truth, which literally might have just happened half an hour ago, 
I have the impression I've made it up. <laughs> I, don't, I don't trust my narration of my own life. Uh, and, and, and so somehow this sort of very dense historical context for that, for, for that in your case, nonetheless reverberates for me as, as, a, as a kind of truth about the oddness of, 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 of narrating, of, of introducing oneself to the world, telling one, one's story um, at all. Are you, I mean, well, but I, I think that's true of a lot of people, a lot of people of this. Because childhood points is no longer the place where we are, and we are the people we work, but we're also not the people we work. So there's a whole stretch of one's life where one has this one being another person, or various other people. Um, and particularly if you've changed languages, that's even more the case. Or if you change class, I suspect it's equally case, or if you've lived through various kinds of um, racial or ethnic position, that won't be the case. Uh, and so, so you're never on stable ground. I mean, your child no longer defines you. Um, I'm afraid we're moving into this sort of Freudian paradigms as well, because um, everybody has a kind of way of background. It's, it's very much pinned down, really. I shouldn't say science but in fact, but that's not easy either way. <laughs> um, but I think we all know what we mean. I mean the area of truth is, is a contentious area about one's past and indeed about the historical past, as we've seen recently with the recalibration of everything. I, I will get the point. <laughs> <laughs> I will get there. <laughs> I, I I some other observations about things you've said about writing this book or the one one of the um one of the things that make that makes as you say you separate this sort of personal history and the way it sort of doesn't map on to history with a capital h uh and, and so that's part of the confusion and the feeling am i making this up because there's there is the story everyone knows and then there's my story and they don't look like the same story and and so one of the things you 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 discover in the course of research in this book and thinking about this book is one of the complicated things for you was well you, you your parents have very different wars so actually they didn't have the same uh, story and we think about Jewish women's life writing today and actually you gender that uh, in in the way you tell it can we talk about that? Hmm, I can remember. <laughs> um, well. The my mother and father were very different. And um, you know, initially, of course, one doesn't think of it in general terms of interesting father. father. Um, and my mother did most of the talking and most of the storytelling. And my father would just you know, offer a comment or two. But sometimes it was a, a comment that would explode with what he said. So the ground of fact or truth was always a little bit wavering. I think that's as true of many families in terms of family relationships, and it wasn't true about the war or about Jews or about persecution or about race. But I, I do think that there's very often a kind of way about that childhood, um, which the child itself has difficulty in putting down. It's probably why it's very hard to remember when things happen or how it happened. Um, anyhow, um, sorry, what's the question? Well, it was the way you, you, I think you understand your parents as having a quite gendered experience of the war years. Well, they did, because, so, I mean, I should read the passage because I say it better in the book than I'm saying it now, but, you know, my father's identity as a Jew was caught up with his penis. Um, whatever he did, it was always, you know, um, <laughs> um, he was circumcised and, um, that kind of telling mark, which was often the determining mark before it went into any kind of SS establishment, um, it wasn't difficult. So my father was always more insecure about the wartime story. He also was dark, he had dark eyes, and he looked, you know, he needed to grow a moustache when they were you know, moving around, living under Canadian papers. Um, I guess he could have passed his hip. What do I know? <laughs> but he always thought, <laughs> and he knew that he was in a lot of places. My mother was blonde, 
blue-eyed, um, very attractive, and, you know, spoke well and so on, and who could masquerade far more easily than he could. In any case, she was a woman, so they were masquerading as peace for her. Uh, but I suspect she was good in the workplace. So, and her ability to masquerade, of course, stayed with throughout her life, because playing this disguise was very interesting, pathetic article about this in the psychology of literature. I mean, it's masquerading for itself, very exciting. I mean, a lot of people found her beautifully exciting. And my mother was a great actress, and you know, she could bring it off. Well, I think there is a way to read your memoir as a portrait of a very heroic woman. And captivating. And so, like you say, she was quite possessed by the image of Marlene Dietrich. Mm -hmm. So that was her sort of, she was modeling herself on this kind Did of... she looked like her back then. And could be her in some, in some sense. I'm just going to um, uh, quote something and then I'll ask you to quote this next thing. Uh, so, my mother's fictions were acts of star quality diplomacy. Facts could be nip nipped and tucked or even invented. My father and I took on the silent complicity of an audience watching a performance everyone else considered an ordinary encounter. This is uh, uh, taken from the moment in Canada where you're just silent witnesses to the fact that you know, no, it wasn't raining yesterday. <laughs> but these people are being told it was. And so it's a sort of, as if you're watching a movie or something that she's very dramatic, she's very captivating everybody's burn. And, and, and you know, you're the sort of, you seek, you're the secret sharers, but it's a peculiar situation to be put in. And then I, I wondered if you could read this as it continues with this quotation. Like some lead actress in love with her part, she carried on playing on stage, rehearsed for the family in secondary roles, tried to control their destinies. These carry on into the present. Their contest, their content has lost its sense. The form is intact, a wandering, drifting narrative which gathers stray details into itself meanders into other stories. So this is from the early part of the book, isn't it? Well, I'm talking about my mother using her memory of Alzheimer's. And um, she still enacts her useful successes in masquerading for a really good reason, as opposed to just masquerading as a woman, which is, of course, one of the films. Um, my gender is a masquerade, actually. Uh, in part, we act differently in different places when we're male or female. So um, my mother was a wonderful actress, but I don't think she thought she was acting. I mean, that's the, you know, we all knew it was a star performance. She enjoyed the audience, but I don't think she knew she performed. <laughs> Right. No, I and I actually cut out a bit where you say that, which I shouldn't have cut out. <laughs> You've had to put it back in. <laughs> I, I, I didn't realize. I, didn't, I, I cut it out. I just didn't want that mentioned, but there you go. <laughs> but, um, but, um, uh, I, I'm being wrong. <laughs> well, there were a couple of reasons I, I asked you to um, uh, quote that part. Uh, a, a third one has just come to mind as well. One of them is. Um, we're here, I think, to try to wonder a little bit about if there's something specific about Jewish women's love writing. And um, and I suppose I think you have inhabited what's very specific about that in this book. But I also know that you're very resistant to that <laughs> proposition in some way. That, 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 that The book itself is very resistant to being captured by any of those identifiers. Uh, and by any notion of identity as, as, as sort of creating anything uh, uh, too defining uh, for a life or, or, or a person, or and certainly for politics. Well, um, oh yeah, I would disagree with. Oh, okay, you disagree <laughs> with my. No, no, I, see, there is a problem with that identity politics, um, which have grown and grown um, ever since, probably feminism in a particular way. And um, 
And they've now reached a point to me, which is, um, and I hope I'm not, maybe anybody is comfortable when I say this. Um, when identities go to war, they cease to be necessarily identifiers in terms of individuality. Um, so they're political positions, and I have nothing against that political position. That's fine, I think, you know, great. Um, but but they're not necessary instant truths. They're not they're not necessarily translated into instant truths. And um, therefore I have occasional problems with identity politics um, as it's grown up over the last couple of years or so. I'm very old, I've been through all these phases, so you know, I know what they like. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. So, so, um, well, one, so one of the things that I suppose we find, I think, in this book in particular is that um, what characterizes both women and Jews is having to mask away, <laughs> having to play a certain part, to figure out what the audience wants from you, um, and perform it in 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 some way, uh, and that. This is something somehow both women and Jews, and particularly Jews in these historical conditions, um, simply have to do for the sake of survival. Uh, and so, uh, and so, your mother um, becomes a kind of extraordinary, sort of true historical figure of of those sort of ideas. And I don't know to what extent you were thinking that or noticing that or what you have to say about that. So when I was, oh, I must still remember when I was writing this book, probably not. <laughs> um, so I know other people's ideas about this book rather better than I can remember them. Right? <laughs> it's not actually, excuse me. Um, Writing is a strange person. You never know altogether what it is that you're grappling with and what you're trying to get at. And I think when I started writing this book, I did not think of my mother as a heroine. She was, in fact, a great problem in my life. <laughs> not for psychological reasons alone, which of course is true for everybody, but for um, you know, practical everyday reasons because she was she'd become an old and, and very difficult woman. Um, and so uh, the whole idea of the book uh, is that, you know, as my children kept telling me, yeah. and if you write down Granny's story, she'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And so I went in search of all these things in part because I was a very bad daughter, in part as I say this to the book. Um, as a reparative act for my mother to, to put her story into some kind of historical context because she would talk about the facts all the time. Um, and she was always seeing her brother here, there, and everywhere, her lost brother who disappeared in the war. Um, and she was certain he was still alive. And she'd see the people who were 20 on the television. And that's you know, my daughter who would say, the king would say to her. Granny, that can't be your brother, he's too young. <laughs> Just say, no, that's my brother. <laughs> and so, so it was an attempt to kind of restore some of the family uh, grounding that I said in the story. Um, when I actually started to write it, it's quite clear that, you know, when you're giving carriage to people on the page, that they take on amplitude. And um, I think by the time I got to the end of the book, I thought, really, my mother was really an extraordinary character. <laughs> but that's not how I felt her, because she'd already been diminished by Alzheimer's, but also by just age. I mean, you know, she was, she was probably younger than I am now when I started writing this book. Um, so, you know, I had a... a I mean, a difficult time of her as the granny in the house, <laughs> but also uh, a difficult record and act in order to put her on the page. And as I did so, I think she took on more moments than I, than I gave her credit for. 
I would like you now to read this quotation, which I think, uh, uh, which I think, <laughs> my the 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 book. The book. has to come next. Yeah. <laughs> During the time that I write about her war, something she has encouraged me to do for years, she all but refuses to speak about it. Certainly, it ceases to be one of her preoccupations. I don't know whether this is because she feels I have stolen it from her or that she has given it to me. In any case, the onus has been transferred. As she approaches her own end, I have taken over her dead. Um, and that does become part of the book that I do you know, in trying to get documentary grounding to my mother's many narratives through my life with her. Um, she gives them up to me. She doesn't want her anything to do with them. And by the time we get to the end, it's actually it's quite painful for me to read now. She no longer wants to know anything about any of this. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I mean it's it's actually I just heard it. I mean I asked you to read it out, obviously I've read it myself, but I just felt it and then I just felt it again and then, um it's quite it's quite an all, it's an uncanny. It's it's so a whole sentence I wrote. Um, and I have to say, I re read it for this um, event, and it's a good book. I mean, it's a good book. <laughs> it really is a good book. You know, surprising. You can know, read your own things, and you think, God, why did I write that? And then suddenly you think, fuck it. It's a good book. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a book that has truths in it. Um, and one of these truths, I think that we that I'm, I suppose I'm trying to lead you towards or touch on is is the suddenness because I think we're finding in the childhood and the, a lot of the narration of you versus your mother is is that you're her audience. She's very different to you. You look very different to her, um, and and somehow you're very distinguished from her constantly, and you have to distinguish yourself from her constantly. Um, and then, of course, we get a line like this where at some point this the he, the, the weight of this history and this inheritance has been passed on <laughs> she has let it go and given it to you and it's yours then now you're dead uh, and 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 um and and somehow this history that was hers that you were trying to bring back to her she's now rejected and it's sort of become yours and 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 Whatever resistance you were putting up to that in childhood, in order to have a childhood, has sort of come uh, crashing down. And I suppose I wanted to lead that back to the other line I asked you to quote there, where, where her wandering mind, she's a, a wandering, drifting narrative which gathers stray details into itself, meanders into other stories, which is a description of her sort of Alzheimer's mind. But it is also a description of something about the story you're telling. Uh, about history, and it sounds a lot like modernism too. And so, so, um, so, uh, uh, it sounds like a wonderful movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds a lot like, um, again, the conditions under which these sorts of stories of women's lives, of Jewish lives, uh, were being told in uh, in other forms and elsewhere. And actually, you know, you you began as a scholar. Uh, thinking about those sorts of modernist ways of storytelling. Could, 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 can I lead you into that whole story? Sure. <laughs> Don't know where it's going. <laughs> what would you like me to say? I, I'd like you to say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think as I was writing this book, if I can even remember that, I did begin to think of my mother as a heroine. Um, it certainly didn't start that way because she was as her parents are to you when you're in your life and they're saying she was homeless <laughs> she was, and she was difficult, she was always difficult. Um, but, but as I went back into the history, uh, through the history books, rather than through my parents' care, I was always very good on German history. I'm a German, I did comparative history, I did not in the age years, and I knew a great deal about German. Journalism, I've written about cabaret and you know, all that. Um, but I actually didn't know where it comes from, like the parents' stories, except what they told the story. I haven't gone into that 
history in terms of Poland and what had gone on there. Of course, I knew about camps, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I knew all the stuff that everybody knows, but I haven't gone into the daily detail of life, mm -hmm. which I did for this book. And um, my mother emerges as a heroine through that time because she did do extraordinary things. Um, and um, and had committed so far from doing it and did save her son and her mother, and indeed, I suspect, my father too. Um, and um, once you've done that, once you went through the, uh, what would you say, the adrenaline charged warriors of survival, um, it's all word that they ever use, all kinds of the word, use the word survival, um, because they didn't think of themselves as survivors. That was much later. That was retrospective glance. They were actually the people that lived in, and they were victorious. They had come through, like all people during the war, had come through. They were still alive, and that was for a victory. Um, whatever happened in the past, no matter how many killed and buried them, they moved. So um, my mother's heroism came back to me in the writing of this, uh, which is not something that was not thought about at all. As I was growing up, what do they Why are they judged? Why are they telling these stories again and again? I don't want to hear them. I <laughs> want to know. Um, and so on. So, so um, I think in that sense, writing is repellent. And I've never thought of writing as therapeutic. I think people use therapy. But certain kinds of stories do have kind of repellent effect, and they are acts of reparation. And this book, in part, was my act of reparation for being a bad daughter, which of course it was too late for my mother to notice. <laughs> Unless she did. Yes. <laughs> I think she was gone. She was gone. Well, you, you said at one point that the, 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 those stories of the camps, of the war, of, uh, you heard them as a child as if they were fairy tales. They were essentially the fairy tales uh, you grew up with, these sort of mythic, impossible stories, good and evil and, 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 and adventure and so on. Uh, and so, um, and so, yeah. Well, you were you both a witness to your mother's confabulations, where you knew the truth, but you were also being told the truth, and could only experience them as sort of fairy tales. As, 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 uh, I mean, we lived in. Uh, um, so, just to tell you the history, I was born in Poland. My parents went to France, and I was a, an infant in France. And my first language, really, although I had heard the baby language. And I spoke French, and that was my first language. And then we moved to Canada, um, which of course, you know, certainly back then was a land of total sanity. And my parents' experience was not something that you could, you know, um, lay on to the, the, the snows of Canada. <laughs> and it is the snowy wastelands of Canada. So growing up was also a person totally growing away from it. Um, and what they talked about were fairy tales, which unimaginable didn't belong in the place where we were. And I think it's a truth of most of the people from just about anywhere if they come to a land which is safer than what they've left. But the trajectory itself distances the family and the children from each other um, in an extraordinary way. And, you know, I, my parents' stories were all about the war for the first years in Canada. And I really wanted to read the Bobsy Twins, you know, I didn't want to know about the war. Bobsy Twins were completely fine, but the you know, anodyne children's stories from North American children for often. It should be, but I mean, one of the ways in which the masquerade, the, 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 the story she had to tell that she was telling to get to get through the war. Well, you've already mentioned it. She, and, and this again, it, this sheds light on the difficulty of Jewish life writing, uh, uh, because the, the history books are, are very hard to find uh, for, uh, for a people who had to keep changing their names and identities in order to survive. It's very hard to go back. And find the records. Often the records were deliberately destroyed. You know, you notice in Poland the records seem to have been deliberately lost in some way. Um, and, and the records you were looking for were very hard to find. But it's also very hard to find 
the records of a people who've either had weird names imposed on them by the authorities, uh, your this, your that, uh, trade names where I think of them, uh, or um, they changed their names because that seemed like uh, it was, and that's how your mother went through the war. And you are trying to, I mean, one of the ironies in this book, it's the most profound irony, but you're saying you're trying to, it was clearly the war taught you one thing, it's very dangerous to be a born son. You've got to change that name. And so in order to not be a born sign, you do what born signs do. You become some you become an opinion lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be fair, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tried to keep that name for a very short time, but it turned out to be impossible because mm. I grew up so long ago that women didn't keep the road. In fact, I've gone to Vienna to postgraduate year when I was doing my PhD. And I couldn't register at the university because they wouldn't accept me. Um, and they wouldn't, you know, the difference between the name on my passport and the name that I wanted to register. In. Anyhow, it didn't work. And I was constantly being called into the European police because um, they didn't, you know, these two people were living, my husband, my dad was living, living illicitly together. Um, and because the names didn't match and I didn't have marriage papers. And, you know, it was just a nightmare. And this is in the 1970s. Um, so you just couldn't do things very easily back then in these terms. So, but there is a moment in this book where you, where, you, where you literally say that you think one of the things that attracted you into this marriage with this Catholic, Italian Catholic husband was the sort of, the, the sort of safe harbour of that name. Of that name. <laughs> yeah, that's name. But I didn't. I was then very stubborn because, of course, one's always doubled up. The double up, yeah. Um, and so I tried to keep my own name, but it, it, it was hopeless. So I, I suppose that, I suppose what I, this is, I suppose one of the irony of the sort of repetition here, I'm taking us into psychoanalysis. I said I get that, but the irony of the thing you do in order to interrupt the history. He is simultaneously a repetition of that history, uh, an exact repetition of that history. Is there in the names? Uh, also, in this story, I mean, uh, in this story of of, of Jew, Jews passing, Jews Jews have been. Uh, I mean, some sometimes they've been characterised as not white, sometimes characterised as white. But now race tends to be thought about in in colour terms, uh, 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 and, and so the Jewish story has always been sort of oddly infused with this thing of names. Uh, and getting rid of the names and not being so easily identified by the names. So, so names become very uh, important. So I just, uh, I, I, did, I did want to look at that, perhaps repetition of compulsion, or re the role of repetition in this, which you were just mentioning, do your parents telling the same stories again and again, repeating them again and again, what's repetition doing? Um, I think this is the first memoir. I wonder if this is the first memoir. I think it might well be the first memoir, or the, the first attempt to do life writing using the conceptual resources of psychoanalysis so deliberately uh, and so awarely. But psychoanalysis as a kind of life writing that perhaps isn't often thought of as such, um, um, you know, guides you uh, into your own life and your own family life and your own history. And so I'm wondering about if you can talk about that in your use of psychoanalysis. Well, as you were talking, Jean, I suddenly thought, I don't remember what I knew about psychoanalysis back then. I must have learned something. Um, uh, so my relationship with psychoanalysis is as ambiguous as my relationship with my family. Because <laughs> um, I've never actually had it. I've never been in psychoanalysis. But um, from quite early on, I started reading, particularly for you know, some of the others. Um, because we're, I went to university in Canada to begin with, and um, back there and then, we used to have a sort of effectively courses, if you're doing literature, in the greats. And Freud turned out in the greats. And so I started reading Freud. And then um, I think it must have been a moment of psychoanalysis back then when I was doing these things. Um, and of course, he came up in various places in the Frankfurt School and so on. And um, then I went to work in New York for a social research firm 
and um, the woman who ran that um, it turned out to be Polish, like me, and had been born there. And then her parents left her in it just before the war. She was about three or something. This is Monica. And um, it turned out that her father was the first psychoanalyst in Poland, who was then practically in New York. And, um, and somehow through her, she was like, I met quite a number of them. Psychoanalyst. So I feel that history became intertwined, and I knew quite a lot about it through them and through the people. And um, although I never had analysis myself. So, uh, you know, the discourse was more familiar to me. Frankfurt School, this and that and the other, than in actual practice uh, as a patient. <laughs> I mean, I felt I'd been through it, but I hadn't been through it, so to speak. And that probably shows you that no, but it doesn't show me because I've been back in it because I'm a writer and I've so written fiction. So I've been on both ends. And um, I guess the role of psychoanalysis in this is that, you know, um, like so many families who are immigrant families, and particularly families that come from places that carry heavy wartime histories, and that could be recently in places like Africa, the Middle East. In my case, it was, you know, the Second World War um, in Poland, where the history was very heavy, I can tell you, <laughs> and carried on for many, many years. Um, the psychoanalysis is quite useful as, um, as a, uh, a research tool and as a way of thinking about your family, because, you know, taking a lot of people in and giving yourself probably a bit crazy. <laughs> Um, and um, so it, it was kind of illuminating in those terms. I've forgotten what the question is that you asked. I'm sorry, I ramble on. Well, you, you, no, I, I mean, I, I genuinely think here we have a form of life writing, a family memoir, also a kind of discovery of inheritances uh, and, and, and the ways in which identities you, you tried to separate from turn out to sort of be <laughs> your living, breathing self, and uh, uh, um, uh, 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 in which psychoanalysis is the is what you, is somebody, you've said, you've always wanted the truth, you've always wanted facts, you went and searched for the truth and searched for the facts, you couldn't find them. And, 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 and so what does a person with an appetite for the truth and facts <laughs> basically do in that situation? And, 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 and somehow psychoanalysis, um, allows you to uh, inspect fantasies, inspect predictions, inspect gaps, inspect feelings, and you, you, you're aware of some things, grief, uh, grief, mourning, you, you, at some point you contemplate whether this is in point terms a work of mourning. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that probably taught me how to think about was process rather than fixing things absolutely at any given point. So that, you know, as a mother that I knew as a mother in my childhood, it was very different from a mother that I knew as a mother in her old age. And um, when you try and write about these things in a kind of historical fashion, then one of the tools that's available to you is the psychoanalytic because it gives you both present and past simultaneously. And I, I suspect that, that might have infiltrated into losing the day. I mean, it gave me a way of seeing and of uh, attempting to recreate, which fiction does in any case, but I wasn't doing fiction, I was doing my own family and you know, some family <laughs> in terms of its its uh, its hauntings and its residues. Um, um, yeah. I mean, you do write a lot about psychoanalysis, and you do say in this memoir that you begin to become aware that the writing is therapeutic. I mean, you might not have been in psychoanalysis yourself, but nor was Freud. But he's <laughs> definitely been considered very important. <laughs> and I think he did his own analysis in his writing. I mean, that was one of the things he did. He would attempt to he would attempt to turn himself into the other. 
in order to have a look at himself as other. And that seems to come very naturally to him as it does to you, uh, as I think it has to for the life rights. And, and, um, and, um, uh, and it occurs to me too that you wrote Freud's Women together with John. Uh, and, uh, and some of Freud's women were his patients. And, you know, in a way, the sort of first patients of psychoanalysis were Jewish women talking about their lives. Uh, and so, um, um, so perhaps we can talk about that as well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I should tell you, Freud women is now being turned into an exhibition. Yes. At the Freud Museum, yeah. starting in October. And, um, I think we'll be very excited because I'm sure they did with 15 years. <laughs> amazing artists. Uh, yes, amazing yeah. contemporary artists, uh, as well as documentary material from the past and letters from Freud and to Freud, blah, blah, blah. Um, mm -hmm. I've forgotten the question. With you, I mean, for example, well, in Freud, and let me also bring in Mad, Bad, and Sad okay. because here we have some stories of hysteria, which maybe you can connect to. To your mother and to all, the, all these, or to any, to me. When you have any Jewish women, you know. I suppose the question of how psychoanalysis led you to see. Well, somehow okay, one could say that psychoanalysis and Jewish women's life narration talking. Uh, are very are born together in some way. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to answer this because I've written so many thick books about the history of this subject by the way we start. This is a very thin book for me. Um, okay, so the, I mean, you know. Madness is itself a very strange concept, and it's very historically linked to the diagnostic criteria of the child. So what is considered, you know, over the top in one generation is just completely ordinary. For example, now we're in a moment where uh, feeling de definitely when E coming talked about feeling coming first, he was actually fighting against an establishment which believed Rationality was a kind of norm that sufficed for all kinds of life. Um, we now come from the other end. We're feeling it's definitely come first, and we have this in some instances. Uh, you know, computers come into this, and it's too long a diagnostic thing to think about here. Uh, there's a way in which um, our prioritizing of feeling has actually diminished our grasp of history and social forces. Um, in everyday life. So, so you know, the, the, the things have changed. Um, the psychoanalysis and Freud's thinking, I mean, I, I read Freud, I'm not trained in any way, I read Freud as a great writer um, of fiction and non-fiction, and indeed a great autobiographer um, in, in the dream book. <coughs> and for me, it was an encounter that was very fruitful because it allows you to think about feeling and think about areas of occlusion, um, which are quite palpable in everyday life, um, and yet often outside of fiction, maybe some poetry, um, one doesn't have access to, doesn't have a language for. And Freud in psychoanalysis helps one with that language. I don't, that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm a diagnostician um, or believe in the absoluteness of diagnosis. Diagnosis are flexible to change with time and have historical attributes and have the pharmaceutical interventions which help to define them and um, give them weight. And these pharmaceuticals sometimes help to cure and sometimes don't. Um, it's a very tangled history. Nonetheless, the languages that came with Freud, the language of psychoanalysis and of the self, of the emotion, have been very interesting to me and do inform many of my books in different ways. 
so they might even like fictions like which I never talk about anymore, but memory and design is palpably a Freudian an attempt to look at the Freudian moment through fiction and through popular fiction, which makes a difference. <laughs> um, and um, losing the dead uses this what Mark Eggs called the information, it's about death too, um, um, in a different way. And in my historical work, um, the place of diagnosis becomes a historicized space, which is filled in to anybody in different ways. And the position of women changes through that, as does notions, do notions of masculinity, femininity, and the various forms of sexuality, which or would not be called sexuality, um, which come out of others. Um, so, yeah, so it's all very, very, very interesting material. And that's why I asked. And I think, I think this, because I suppose one of the ways in which hysteria, even all along perhaps, has been understood is as a sort of mobile. Sort of, uh, I mean, you know, if we're talking about Jews, then, then the entirety of French understandings of Eurasthenia grew with the it, uh, arrival in France of the Jews from the East. This was in the 1880s, say, 1890s. And um, it's quite clear that to us now we'd say, well, there were people from another culture. Hello! No, they had medical diagnosis. This was a time when there were more doctors in the French assemblies in the eyes in any other profession, and doctoring had become, I mean, as it is today, slightly differently, a very, very important, um, a set of, a very important sphere of knowledge, let's say, about the real, um, um, which still is, but not at all in the same way. Uh, we still, have recourse far too much to diverse to categories as if they were who's fixing granite and that actually we know what fixing sand they may help what they give you may help but you know lots of stuff helps people get through lots of stuff helps people get through including the diagnosis of hysteria <laughs> for people who did you know manifest um, many many symptoms which we would not consider serious symptoms. But you know, secretly doctors still use the diagnosis of the story. I mean, if you talk to somebody who's working in any big hospital um, in places where paralysis turns up. Because well, of this historicizing of uh, historicizing of the symptoms also that that but what it seems to always say something about is our uh, I mean, which brings us us back to psychoanalysis, but also to life writing and particularly to stories in which there are a lot of gaps, is is um is the idea that the hysteric in some way, normally with their body, normally with her body, um, uh, but in all kinds of symptoms and other ways, is trying to speak of which the, the historical moment or the social system she's under is a kind of not a permission to tell this story or to express this feeling. And so it's coming out. Uh, in other ways, and so it's a clue to the stories, the cracks, the things that are not being told that the life writer is perhaps. Uh, there's a lovely, um, so we are here at, this is Hermione Lee's thing. I, I know in her in her book, Body Part, she begins that book with, uh, um, I think a quote from Gaskell, from Elizabeth Gaskell about how, if you love your subject, you want to tell their life, you've got to get anecdotes, because the anecdote is the, ex, it is, Etymology gets about the off the the off the record stories that a life writer has to find the off the record stories, not the official narrative, uh, but find the things uh, that really tell you about uh, and that bring the body into it in some way. Uh, uh, and so, um, uh, and so, I think perhaps we can think about um, these going in search of these gap these these gaps, these stories, as, as very directly connected to uh, people who've not been able to tell their life stories or to match it up uh, with the kind of official narratives in some way. And I suppose I did want to link that back to um, 
to what has all along been a form of Jewish storytelling in religious sources, which is Midrash, which is a hermeneutic method, a method of interpreting the sacred texts by looking at the gaps. There's a lot of gaps in those texts, things that, things that, like how, what happened then, you know, that literally what happened then, there seems to be a gap here, but also I can't believe in this God or this character if they did this, so there must be something missing. So, <laughs> so let me just breathe it. So between the lines, that, so there's a whole tradition of telling stories uh, that has sustained Jew, Jews in their religious life by um, by finding the places where you can secrete anecdotes into the official narrative and sort of draw on that uh, for a kind of spiritual sustenance and for, for the sake of survival. So I, I suppose I wanted to link it to this whole <laughs> overall theme, and I know it's very perverse to do that to you. It's fascinating. I'm just drawing you into a religious position. I know you love that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's very interesting. I mean, it's very interesting that, that you can fill in the gaps. And it's so and it's so often like the what else we all do. The, someone like Aviva Zornberg or a writer like that who, who, who is a religious writer, she I mean she really does read Midrash as the unconscious of the of the official narrative, the official text. So she finds all these categories applicable. So the oldest forms we have of, of Jewish narrative, which is of course uh, biblical. Um, I, I realize there's 15 minutes left at the end of this it's session, and shouldn't I be asking? Questions? <laughs> shouldn't I be asking <laughs> questions? If, if there are questions, that's fantastic. But don't let us interrupt you equally. Ask anybody other questions. How did your mother land they, my parents together, and my brother and me, we all land here. Um, they, so you'll have to read the book, but I mean, they had a very interesting war. <laughs> and um, after the war, when, when the communists had come into Poland, what people never talk about post war, they always think, you know, we'll finish it on the day that you celebrate. Well, it doesn't, it lasted quite a lot longer in various insidious ways. And the war in Poland, you could say, went on for about 40 years um, when we left. Um, and that war was about which government was actually going to take charge. Um, you know, the nationalists to be treated one way and the communists to be treated another way. The Soviet Union was in there. Uh, who was supporting them? Should we kill some more Jews? That would be true. Um, and how do you make a living in this bond out country? And don't forget your stuff, which is near where my parents had come from, where they had spent part of the war. It was gone, it was completely flattened. And, and um, uh, there, were, there were, you know, only people who could sit through the refuse there. So they all moved out to other partially surviving towns. And my parents moved to Woods, which was south of the industrial subject. Um, where there were no Jews left, um, very few. And um, yeah, anyhow, I, I get lost in this material. That's okay. So, did, they, did she pass so on through the war? She passed. My, both my parents passed through the war after initially having been ground out that the new Jews should have killed school Jews in the day that they got out. It's very exciting. <laughs> um, but they came out. My, they, my grandparents also. I think I said so, a lot yeah. of people have been saying. One, by the way, one of the reasons I wrote this book was that I was worried about the imposition of the Trump Holocaust um, on the narrative. Got many narratives that come out of the war. The Second World War, because my parents had never used the term Holocaust. They'd never used the term Shoah, which came with Claude Lanzmann's film. And these terms, which are partially well, created by historians, for like, but also created by the existence of Israel, the coming to be with Israel, and a particular version of the narrative, a particular historical version of the narrative, actually wiped out all the other stories of the war that had been going through. 
I'm making a tally in my mind to speak virtue. So I decided we'll have to explore more facilities, more places. Um, if you like the, the dominant, the hegemonic story of the Holocaust. Um, anyhow, my parents moved first out of Poland in Portugal, France, uh, to Paris, um, which was all pretty good, the necessary papers to go to uh, North America. My mother had it in her mind. My mother is a great survivor, as we would now say, they were the survivors back then. <laughs> um, my mother was a great getter through. She said, no, 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 we, we, we want to go to Canada, um, which has an irony, who, who comes with it's about sure. We have a house for all the goods that people had had stolen from them or taken from them by the Nazis, went to this place called Canada in Auschwitz. <laughs> they didn't know that yet, and it was a great common language. But my mother had in her mind in Canada, so I thought we could tell us if we want to go down there. They didn't get the necessary papers. So they went to France and we became French for a couple of years and eventually Portuguese. When the British came to The Canadians, who are wonderful now, do not have a good watch on history and accepting people from elsewhere or indeed a person who still went to play in the jungle. And we, you know, Britain is terrible now in its immigration policies and asylum policies. But even after the close of the Second World War, Many countries were very, very tough about the asylum and deep immigration policies. Canada was one of them. Oh. There are a lot of jokes about joke. here. Do the joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. My father, <laughs> your father's joke, yeah. My father was so pleased that he eventually got to Canada. And my father came to Canada. He did come to Canada. He did come to Canada. And my father was the repository of Yiddish in the family. Uh, my mother didn't love to speak it very much. <laughs> they had very, very views on things in the parents. And um, he would tell the story about Moses, um, um, which uh, I'm going to be more messy because I'm not a good joke teller. But the story goes that Moses was, of course, a stammerer, and so he could never get full. Word out this is why it took so long to get the father's land. <laughs> um, um, and when he came down from the mountain and was telling the assembly of mass that God had promised to land to them, he didn't get the last of the He was meant to be Canada. <laughs> 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 I feel that don't like it very well. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is one of my father's favorite books. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this sounds like a, a wonderful book. I'm so sorry that I did not have a chance to read it uh, before today. I'm sorry also that we didn't hear more from the book. Like I would have, I would would have loved to have a little bit more reading. But I want to very happy to read it. Um, specifically about the structure uh, of it. It's it's so difficult, I think, to write trauma memoir. In particular, it's it's such a necessary recursive project. Mm -hmm. um, what is what is the shape of the book like and and well, the shape of the book is something I've like thought about for a long time. Um, so also used to the word trauma, which of course came on the news today, didn't it? Um, so even when I was writing this book, I had a bit of a shudder, historical shudder. I'm a historian too, <laughs> about the use of the word trauma for everything that everybody goes through in everyday life. Um, and um, it wasn't a word that was very current, um, certainly in the immediate post-war. And um, it's a word that was refused by the German reparation authorities. Um, it was trauma, of course, not a physical wound. And um, those students who managed to survive the war did not have physical wounds. <laughs> um, except my father did, my father so that, that's something else. Anyhow, um, but the use of the word trauma had become omnipresent even when I wrote this book, and has become even more so now. And it, of course, applies to just about anything. And, you know, um, of course, we're all traumatized by having little children, but we're also not, because all of us have it, and it gets through 
not so much that for example. So this book is started up with also an, an anti-trauma, an anti-use of the word Holocaust of one story narrative. And um and the structure and, the word and the word survivor happened. Well, my parents were busy being survivors, but they didn't think of themselves as survivors, and that was not the word applied to them. Again, that thing later. Vietnam changed the entire narrative of the war years because it allowed both the use of the word trauma and post traumatic stress disorder. It uh, took a bit of a while to get into the diagnosis of manuals, but nonetheless began to be applied because of the terrible problems of the Vietnam War veterans. Um, and but then it was replied, applied retrospectively to people who survived the Second World War. Um, Anyhow, the structure of this book, <laughs> um, which was extremely difficult because I wanted to interpose what I had learned. Um, and the very, it's the shortest book I've written, I think, except for the other memoir. It's <laughs> <laughs> real life, it's very expensive. Fiction takes forever, history takes even longer. <laughs> um, um, the structure of the book came to me. I don't quite know what I'm thinking, probably on the train leaving Poland, which was that I needed to tell the story of the search and I needed to tell the story of now, which was my mother now, um, the now of the writer, uh, which was the now of losing your memory, the now of Alzheimer's. And uh, what this book was about, and this book was a form of reparation for my mother that had been such a bad daughter. And refused her stories, and now I was looking for the education of the ready access, accepted it in its form of them. Um, and so that's the setting of the book, if you like. And then it has sections in the past where I actually tried to recreate aspects of my parents' work and sections of the present where I look for it. And these narratives lush and don't lush. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's because there's a line I'd like you to read on that question of structure, but I just set it up a little bit by saying you put your PhD, I think your graduates were you, you were you Bruce was your guy, and and of course memory has always been a, a theme for you, but in, in Bruce you can go back and recover lots of time. And here we have the Alzheimer's patient sort of setting you off on that journey into recovery. Bruce also is a the great life, perhaps the greatest life writer, and so perhaps the greatest Jewish life writer in some ways. Um, on, his but, uh, uh, on his mother's side, <laughs> the, the woman, the woman's side. Um, but, the, um, but here we have a line from your book, just on that question, I think it's structure a little bit. Yes, this book is a very funny book, and I used to joke, but it's, it's, it somehow doesn't work as a joke anymore. Mm -hmm. It's my happy holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and in the writing of this book, this line came out, no Proustian thoughts of um, Only a Borgesian labyrinth with an accumulation of disappearing objects. And that tells you a little bit about my documentary. So there were many documentary searches after this, and many good books written about um, people's parents during the war years and the various journeys that they made often together. Um, Daniel I mean, there, there are many, and, and uh, this was an early one. And um, I found maybe I just wasn't as good as finding a documentary evidence um, as other people have been. Um, that there were only disappearing things in the past, or we found traces, but I couldn't actually get to anything. I mean, you know, the house my parents lived in, in which we you know, went there. It's gone. You know, there are houses here, there are houses there. Right in the middle of it is the number of my parents' place. It's not there. <laughs> it was a bomb hit. It, was, it became carbon. <laughs> um, the accumulation. So there was a combination of disappearing you know, mm -hmm. So it became, you know, a real story. It was the story of the disappearance. Mm -hmm. And it was like my mother's mind. Um, yeah. So it, in the, it was very it was very interesting for me to do this, and I have to say, you know, um, I've been to Poland before, and I've been to Poland since, of course, 
the regular translators of my work. <laughs> Even in Soviet days, I don't quite know why, because I had no reason to know that I was Polish when I wrote Cavalry, but um, nonetheless. Um, yeah. I mean, that's another thing, isn't it? That you, what your first book, really one of your first books was Cabaret, which again leads on to this theme of masquerade that you're picking up. I, do, I feel like we have room for maybe one more question, mm. do we? If there is. I want to, I've got about like, the 50 questions, but to narrow it down to one. I'm really interested in your mother's involvement in this whole process because you talked beautifully about it being an act of reparation and sort of atonement for being a bad daughter, which I'm sure you were, but feeling like that. Um, and so yeah. then she, yeah, sort of taking the next one and giving her bones back to her or fixing them for the sake of family. And you, you said by the end of the process that she didn't really care, she'd sort of gone to a different place. What was her involvement during the development of it? And how also, the part B of that is how did your relationship to your parents change as you did go back into this sort of granular detail of the life before before you existed or when you were able to? Well, to answer that second part first, I was, after I'd written this book, I was in great admiration mm. of parents. And I was, in fact, in the process of unraveling the therapist as well, which allowed me, of course, to, to learn a great deal more about myself, but what Dolores says it was therapeutic. It was therapeutic, not my setting out to do any kind of therapy, because I found that certainly, as I tried to relive certain bits of my childhood, it just seemed incredibly odd. You can imagine this you know, very strange family arriving in Canada, just, which is, after all, the center of sanity <laughs> in many ways. And, and you know, they were really, really strange. And then I go to school, and, what, what, you know, what's going on? So, so there was all of that. Um, I always forget the questions as I'm talking. I it was uh, what was your mother's involvement? How mm -hmm. much so she, she didn't didn't around really, the morning. You know, I'm sure she would have been very happy if I'd written it. And by the time I'd written it, she was in no stage to read it. Did and she know that you were writing it? Yeah, she knew you were it. She knew I was writing it, but you know, she would have much rather have sat and just stayed and talked to her any mm -hmm. time uh, rather than be writing. I was always writing actually. <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> You're just writing again. There's no time for me. My mother was, was not an easy person, I have to say. She was, in many ways, a great woman. Um, and I found out more about her greatness as I went into the past because it was hardly an easy war. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was a star. And my father, too, in his own way. But my father never spoke about any of it. My mother talked a lot of it. Um, um, but she wasn't easy, and and of course, you know, one thing that's really difficult when people get Alzheimer's is that you don't quite know the process. You know, everybody's process is different because of the individualized illness, um, and you don't know when you're hitting a blank wall of negation or when you're actually hitting a hole, <laughs> a real line. Mm -hmm. And so it was very, very tricky. And and uh, this book was very. I mean, most books aren't very good for me because they're too much work. It's not going to be books, it's very good for me. <laughs> because um, it allowed me to understand my body far better. I also, after this book, spent quite a long time working in a memory lab when we were working on Alzheimer's. And um, as a kind of, not quite a writer in residence, but a pseudoscientist. <laughs> <laughs> and the memory man, the the man that you wrote, and I wrote the novel. It's great to write a fact book about it, but I just couldn't do it. And I wrote the, the memory man, which is a novel, which was kind of a supplement to losing it dead because it allowed me to do things which were imagined, which were as real, more real than I could do through actual documentary searches. Fiction is a funny book because it allows you to write you can't quite reach. Through, um, history. <laughs> That's a whole other world of questions. Going <laughs> <laughs> to the past that life writing can't reach. Yeah. You can't, you can't. I mean, I could make up what my mother was thinking, but I can't really. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, you know, I have the voice, so yeah. I can imagine that I have to tell you that if you're doing it in fiction, you can just do it. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. But but I, yeah, I was going to say, I'm completely fascinated by this idea of writing 
about a woman who continually rewrites herself in her in her storytelling. Mm -hmm. This the the very strange shady line it's between strange. line and storytelling, and probably it's about intention. But that's you know, Virginia Woolf did it all the time as well. And Absolutely, we don't hold it against her. It's a mm -hmm. this is a constant creative recreating of your past up to almost the present moment. Yeah, and, and then finish that that way, but because that's yeah. what it seems like. But in fact, it was this invention, the real invention. Yeah, my mother is a very good storyteller. Yeah. And of course, you are also enough to be inspired by storyteller, but you are also pinning it down here, aren't you? you are, it's, a, it's an antidote to storytelling, whilst also storytelling. I wonder if, I mean, if you're a little bit over time, I really didn't want to stop talking, but um, um, I wonder if there is a little passage that you could read just to sure. kind of end on a on a bit of a flavour of the book, because we will all you, instantly you go out and buy it, I think. I mean, you could begin at the beginning, although that's your father. But, but you said you were saying that you wished you could read about your your father. Oh yes. Uh, and his failure to conceal his circumcision. That his. Um, that might be you, you actually begin with your father. I begin with my and, father. And, but and, that's and, but it's quite a that. powerful passage, yeah. that opening. We can have it as a teaser for those of us who haven't played. Oh, this is a little section called Legacies. It's the first section. This is the one I feel really guilty about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Okay. still. laughs> In my father's last days, he transformed the ordinary London hospital ward where he lay into an assess camp. The white coated doctors became black uniform officers, their boots hammering over floorboards with deadly intent as they approached his cell. Medical implements were instruments of torture. The oxygen mask would prevail with poison gas. My momentarily absent mother was a whore servicing the ranks, whether willingly or not was a moot point. In any case, she was not altogether to be trusted. Only I was, and I would help him to get out of here. His hand gripped my wrist. His eyes, two glistening points of feverish bleeding in a national face, gazed at me in desperation. He seemed to know me, though I didn't know who that me was meant to me to be, a sister not yet lost, perhaps. He spoke in Yiddish, a language he hadn't used to address me in for over 30 years, and he spoke with a flat, grim certainty, his voice a hoarse whisper emerging from some depth of pain to his screen. Occasionally, he would raise his head from the pillow, and with a tense alertness echoed in the bite of his fingers, would check to see whether one of them was listening. My rational protests were hushed into stillness. A day earlier, he had tried to make his escape, a pajama-clad figure breaking out from the confines of University College Hospital into the freedom of the streets. He had been brought back by an informant in cahoots with my mother. But that night, with my help, his escape be certain. It was that night he died, November 20th, 1981. The content of my father's delirium shook me. He hadn't talked of the war years since my childhood, yet at the end they were there, intact, like some wolf that would obscure and venomous secret, which all of his later experience couldn't obliterate. A slight shift of the kaleidoscope of consciousness, and those distant years surfaced, still charged with enough raw emotion to repel his hallucinatory fantasies. Terror for him always came in uniform. Wow, right, well, I mean, <laughs> so I should say that there's a lot of your father in everyday madness. So that if this is more your mother's book, that I think you do the yeah the men in your life could show up in, in more in everyday madness. So it's you could, you could well, because that was a book about death of my husband. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Thank you both very, very, very much. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Thank you all. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you both for coming. See you on the 12th of March. We thank you very much.